So when their rational material search found nothing, their rational material conclusion was, there is nothing to find. What was going on up to the end of the 19th century in experimental psychology was that they were trying to measure introspective features, um, consciousness features. And what they realized that it was just too, they couldn't pin it down, it, wasn't, it wouldn't, couldn't be quantified. So behaviorism started off as a purely methodological step which said, well, we know there is all this inner consciousness stuff, but we can't do science with it. So what we'll do is we'll just study things that are measurable. So behaviorism at first was merely methodological and didn't deny the existence of consciousness at all. But then the philosophers got hold of it. And they turned a merely methodological program into a metaphysical lunacy. Uh, they started to deny the very existence of consciousness. And the self. And the self, of course, also, because that goes with it. But it is actually the craziest thing that has ever been said in the whole history of philosophy. <laughs> It was a massive misdirection. Ignore completely what you feel inside, the philosophers said. You are just the story of your bodies and your material brains. Psychologists, philosophers, scientists of mind generally will say, yes, of course, there's a natural folk psychology language of what it's like to be. But with sufficiently good work, we will realize where that comes from, we will be able to explain what that sense of having an inside is without any special sorts of explanations like souls or um, vital forces or, or whatever. Science had declared there was no little man inside our heads who sees what we see and pulls the levers. How then to account for the persistent feeling that there is it was Michael Gazzaniga who offered a solution. He proposed an ingenious way of giving us the feeling of having a self without having to invoke a little man inside our heads. His idea came from revolutionary treatment for severe epileptics, which involved cutting their brains in two. Experiments on animals suggested that both halves would continue to function, but one side wouldn't know what the other was doing. Could that possibly be true for the human? It just seemed phantasmagoric at the time that uh, the left hand literally would not know what the right hand was doing. An apple in the left hand could not be matched by an apple placed in the right hand. I mean, that just, that, how could that be? What science knew was that the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. And certain functions, like speech, came from one side only. We set up an experiment where uh, we had the left hemisphere doing a task, and simultaneously we had the right hemisphere doing a task. And what that means is the left hemisphere can talk to you about the one it's doing, because that's where the language system is. But the right hemisphere doesn't talk but yet it can process the information and carry out an activity. So you can get the right hemisphere left hand to point to objects and pick things up. And really the left hemisphere doesn't know why it's doing it because the information has been isolated in this right disconnected hemisphere because of the surgery. In other words, the problem for the split brain patient was that although the hemisphere that talks, the left hemisphere, can see what the right is doing, it doesn't know why. The classic test was we showed a, a picture of a chicken uh, to the right visual field, left hemisphere, and the subject could choose one of four choices, one of which was a, a picture of a chicken claw that was most related to the chicken. And to the right hemisphere, we showed a picture of a snow scene, and there was a four objects for the, the right hemisphere, left hand, to choose one of which was a shell which was the most related thing, a snow shovel. So we show these pictures, and uh, the first case we ran this on, case PS, immediately points to the chicken claw and to the shovel. And uh, we said, Paul, why, why are you doing that? What the patient replied led Gazzaniga not only to come up with an explanation of the self, but also to say where the self was located. And he looks up and he goes, oh, 
Well, he says, uh, the chicken claw goes with the chicken, and then he's looking down at his left hand, pointing at the shovel, and the left hemisphere is sort of watching this activity go on and cooks up a theory to be consistent with the actual behavior. And he goes, and you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. So he immediately generates a theory to explain a behavior that makes it consistent with the overall cognitive set that he has. So then you get this idea, well, he's interpreting his own behaviors, his overt behaviors, to be consistent with a storyline. And we finally realize that there is this something unique in the left hemisphere with respect to this, these cognitive activities. It's constantly trying to seek patterns, seek understanding towards our actual behavior, felt states, and, and all the rest. It's trying to tell a story that's consistent with what's going on. And that becomes the narrative. That becomes the self-story of who we are and what we're doing and how we're interacting throughout life. So that was the answer. Our feeling that there was a self inside our bodies was an illusion. It was just a sign that the interpretive capacity in the left hemisphere of our brain was working. I'd like to give a lecture entitled The Left Hemisphere, Don't Leave Home Without It. It is the thinking, language-based, hypothesis-generating hemisphere. It is the one that does the heavy lifting for our cognitive life. If you think of it as a theory-generating hemisphere, how do A and B relate? That interpreter chip, that little wiring, is in our left hemisphere. And it doesn't seem to be in the right. Gazzaniga had solved the problem of the self as a ghost in the machine by replacing it with a mechanism, a bundle of neurons whose effect is to create just the impression of there being a ghost in the machine. Ultimately, they're circuits. That's the assumption of neuroscience. There's a circuit in there that finds you the self, always asking the question, what's the meaning of this? Why did I do that? and then you seek an answer. It all comes from a very basic system. It's the added chip that says, how does A relate to B? The interpreter had finally provided a scientific underpinning for Bloom's idea of the self as story, but at a cost, because now there was only the story. The self was merely a byproduct of the story, just a narrative construction to help the story along. No one would argue that person A has a theory about person B, right? You have a theory about your spouse, your children, your father, your mother. You have it stored in your brain. You, know, you respond to them in certain ways. Why is it a big jump to say you have a theory about yourself? We have a system for generating a story about ourself, and it can take the next step and convince itself that it is the one in charge. So a bundle of wiring in the left hemisphere tells a story about having a self and then believes it. The question is, should we? How much should we trust the interpreter and the story it tells us of what we are? I don't think Gazzaniga's view of a narration in the left hemisphere is complete. He sees this interpreter as being the thing that he is actually us, but it isn't the whole of the self at all. It seems to me that what the, the sort of narrative that the left hemisphere is creating is one which is designed to explain what it is we're doing now and why we're here at this moment. So it tries to make sense, often I think quite spuriously, because it's only got part of the data, if you like. It's only got part of the information to work on. It's only got the bits that it's consciously aware of, actually. So it creates a story which, which helps us get through. And it's a very optimistic one, you know, in keeping with the notion that the left hemisphere is essentially an optimist. It's a, because it feels it can control things, it knows that it will be able to order everything so that everything will be all right in the future. And rationalists, utilitarians, functionalists have always had a view of society that is ameliorist, that they will be able to sort things out. Have we made a mistake, McGilchrist asks, by listening too much to this one part of our mind? 
have we patterned ourselves and our world too much on its utilitarian and functional worldview?